So you got sage grass. This Pat Nisha's dad is a big deer hunter. Uh -huh. Okay, and him and his buddy have spent untold numbers of hours and thousands of dollars seeding this this field uh -huh. with clover, and you can see the wheat for food. Right, it's a food plot. Right, uh -huh. and I don't even know how many thousands of dollars uh -huh. they've spent. <laughs> but I can't even graze the sheep in here because the clover is too thick. Oh, yep. really? They'll get dirty butt if I yep. if I let them eat this too much. And there's you look, there's very little other grasses yet. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I should I invest the money and sow some orchard and fescue and other stuff, or should I just give it a year or two to see let it kind of go wild and see what it's going to do? I'd mow it and I'd throw fifty bucks worth of a mixed pasture seed down on here yep. to get some grasses in there. Yep and and see what it does okay. um it wouldn't be a bad idea to take some soil samples from a couple different spots we can talk about I've this done it. I've yeah. Got them. yeah i've done that for this, this field um it, the whole farm needs lime the whole farm's right? very acidic yep. um, 4.6 to 5 maybe five and a half in some pastures where all where did you send your soil samples up to the to be? The, the state, USDA, yeah, yeah. The state. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a, a, a better place to send it. You'll actually get a comprehensive panel. Good, that's what I panel. want. Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah, and I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. Sure. Uh, to when you send me that. Perfect. But you can see I've got apple trees. I've got willow. Mm -hmm. There's a, a bunch of possum planted uh, persimmons. Persimmons out, yep. Out in here, and I'm going to leave all that. Um, what else? Oh, well, there's also some uh, honey locust I planted that's mm -hmm. just scattered around in here. But you can kind of see my pine problem at the edge of this. Yeah. I've already went through twice, Nick, and thinned the pines. Mm -hmm. And I've still got that many left. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, and am I right that they're literally not helping me at all? Yeah, they're not really doing much for you. I mean, you could leave them for a future timber harvest, but, I mean, <clears throat> if your focus is we need to get... We need to get meat yeah. coming off of this yeah, land. Yeah. Silvo pasture. I'm going to turn Take, the entire 40 acres. Great. Take them out and switch it all over to hardwoods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I'm probably <clears throat> going to leave. You'll you'll have tons and tons of biodiversity if you switch everything over to hardwoods. Yeah, yeah. And you just get rid of yeah. all of the and I'll pines. I'll probably leave one or two pines in each pasture. Sure. Just because I don't, just we because don't know everything. To... Maybe they are doing right. something and I right. don't know it. So I'm going to leave a few. Yeah. And I'm going to cut 95% of them out. Got a lot of I think that's that's oh, great. Dude, look, they, I've already been through here and thinned this one time. Mm -hmm. And there's still that many. They've spent thousands of dollars mm -hmm. on this. It's and, really thick clover. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. But but, <clears> but you know the, the paddock over there I'm so proud of. I've literally spent zero dollars on seed. But it's completely eaten up with flea beetles and thrips. Yeah. Just, just completely obliterated by flea beetles and thrips. You How can you just see that? it, because the leaves. I can see the flea beetles on the passiflora right there. Every year they'll, they'll, not plow it, but they'll disc it. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll bush hog it multiple times a year. They'll disc it. They'll mm -hmm. sow it. So, so many man hours and so many thousands of dollars. And literally, I'd rather have that pasture than this mm -hmm. pasture. Oh yeah. And they're also killing the biome when they do that. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're also messing up all the underground diversity that I need. Mm -hmm. to have a sustainable pasture that can go through a drought mm -hmm. or that can go through the winter. But that's I want people to really understand throwing money at this is very often not the solution. Yeah. If you're if you're broke as a joke right now like I've been for many years and you're like, well I don't have any money. I can't I can't, you know, hire the seed drill to come. I can't pay for the seed. I can't pay for the lime. Most of that stuff's unnecessary. Most of it is, yep. Now, I don't, I don't know, you might know, Nick, I don't know what that is, but the sheep love that. Do you know what that is? I have, you know, grasses, I've never, I've never really gotten very well educated on my grasses. It's always just been the same set of prescriptions, no matter what kind of grasses you have, it's always been the same answers. Yeah. You just get animals on there, cycling through it, doesn't matter what kind of grasses you have, as long as you... Um, optimally remineralize the soil. Yep. You don't have to, right. but I mean, if, if money's no object, we can get the minerals on there to bring it up into balance. And then we get animals cycling over it yep. with um, pulsation events of grazing and trampling. Yep. It doesn't matter what grass is on there, it fixes it. So I've never, I guess yeah. I've just never had the need to, yeah, to know. 
to know. I, literally, you just rotate the animals like nature's always doing, and good good shit happens. Is yep. That, is that a good maxim? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> And when absolutely. I gotta say good shit, I mean that in several different ways. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Quite literally. Not for real. Sure. <laughs> out and I don't know what, what do you think about these little felt circles they're pretty cheap mm -hmm. and, and they because if you put mulch there yeah the chickens or the wildlife are just gonna mess it up I and think that's fine I think this serves the same purpose and then also I can reuse that yep after a year or two when it didn't need it I can move it to a new tree absolutely you like that yep okay. most ranchers would be like this is a terrible field and for cattle it would be but, but for sheep and goats sheep and goats would wear they when I I haven't had them over all here, that sweet gum in there you know, and the maple and leaf, the oaks there and won't the, be a leaf left on the there's branch. elm yeah this Except is for the wonderful persimmons. they won't touch the persimmon yeah. leaves but they'll eat every other leaf in here this and this is wonderful wonderful forage for them yeah and that that when I found that out that's when I fell in love with sheep it's like oh I don't have, to have this beautiful pasture of fescue thirty one mm -mm. I can just let it be whatever it naturally is mm -hmm. and the sheep will say thank you and and they will. Turn it into delicious meat. Should I add white mulberry <clears throat> to all these paddocks? Is that another layer that I that's, that would be worth the money? Potentially. Um, I want to go over kind of your your management style and and get a feel better for the way you're wanting to go forward with your livestock and and how you're wanting to manage. Um, there's there's a lot you can do to to cause a lot of um, compression in the time frame and the productivity, but it requires more effort. But I don't know where you are on that spectrum, how much effort you have time to, to deal mm. with, how much you're willing to put in. You know, there's there's a, a discussion that needs to be had there before gotcha. I could answer that. Well, I can tell you where I'm on the well. spectrum. Beginner. Right. <laughs> so what you're doing right now, what you're doing right now is fantastic. Okay, okay, okay. I'll, I accept that. This field is my neighbor. He's mm -hmm. getting older. He used to have horses forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's horse pasture. And he's still, he's a big believer in bush hogging. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked him when I first got the sheep if I could lease his pastures and, and basically pay his property taxes mm -hmm. every year to rotate them. And yeah. he's like, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want a bunch of fences, and I don't want a bunch of, you know, I just want to keep it looking like a golf course, basically. Yeah. But, uh, you see my perimeter, not my perimeter, but my temporary fence right there. Mm -hmm. I actually run it right up against him, and he actually came over the other day, because he, he rides his four-wheeler all the time. Mm -hmm. He had actually seen the sheep in action, and saw what it looked like after they'd been there for three days. And he's like, well, you know, if you want to, you can start rotating them around the back here. No, it's no problem if you want to do that. So, oh yeah. Already he's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. It looks good. Mm -hmm. but it looks really good when they get done. It looks like you uh, lawnmower's been here. So he's going to let me start rotating through the back of his of his farm, and then I I suspect in a few years he'll be like, yeah, I'll just rotate him through the whole farm. I won't mm -hmm. have to bush hog. I mean, there's a little good grass in here, but mainly it's just junk. Tell you what, though, if you uh, if you get uh, putting together a couple. Of uh, the Johnson Sioux bioreactors, the beam compost makers. Right. You start utilizing that out here, this is gonna explode. You'll see a lot of these weed species, you know, the the unpalatable forbs go away. Because they like it low pH and poor soil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the, the environmental conditions will change. Right. And that pH will change. Right. You can add your minerals to the Johnson Sioux, and then when you liquidize that and put it out with your tractor or your pickup truck or your side-by-side -side, you're putting the minerals directly where they need to go and you're changing that soil profile the furry ones are the first year and then when they get next year they'll shed that just like a dog sheds its winter coat yeah and actually they shed so thoroughly that my older ones for a minute i thought they had mange or something was wrong with them i mean they shed it all but then it starts growing back yep. and they look great again. And they're such herd animals that even if one jumps the fence, mm -hmm. which they could all easily do at any moment, they could jump that without even trying, they'll come right back in. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be away from the flock. Mm -hmm. When I get these pastures the way I want them, 
we'll have to run the deer off with a stick, like yeah. literally. Yeah. My, my highest fence wire is 42 inches. Mm -hmm. They can jump that, no problem. Oh, yeah. But they'll be in here eating the persimmons, eating mm -hmm. the mulberries, eating the... You get this filled up with persimmons? Right. <laughs> it's going to yeah. be game yeah. over. For free. And I'm it, like, it's it, going to be so still, ridiculous. Get, get that out of his mind. He's like, no, you know, we, we'll get in here and we'll bush hog this and we'll plant some clover. I'm like, no, we're not going to do any of that. We're just going to let nature fix it for free. Mm -hmm. And then there will be, be more better. deer here than over at your place. Mm -hmm. They haven't even really got to the tree leaves yet. They're staying in the shade over here. Mm -hmm. They do tend to run the fence and graze there mostly. Uh, but then when, when they're out over here, they'll start moving to the middle. But they do stand, they like to stay near the fence and all, obviously like to stay in the shade. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I think Silvo Pasture, that's like there's what, 150 reasons why it's smart. Yeah. But your animals are healthier. They're, they're healthier, they're, they're stressed, happier. They're happier. You, your stocking density on your land goes up. Yeah. Why would right. you not? Right. Why would you not want to have a higher yeah. stocking density? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It reduces the amount of wind coming across your property, which reduces the amount of transpiration, keeps more moisture on your property. Water is life. I mean, the list just goes on and on. And then every time when I rotate them through here next time, I'm, I keep moving the fence back. Yeah. Right, and so I'll give them another 20 feet of this junk. Mm -hmm. And like that before, that this looked like that. Mm -hmm. And they've just wore it out two times now, and you can still, there's a few, but not many. They've mm -hmm. just about killed Are them all. these persimmons you got to tag on? This, this, this may be a persimmon. Yeah, I, I tagged it, so I thought it was a persimmon. Is There's probably 25 acres of that, which yep. the, the soil's gonna be very low pH, Yep. very thin, um, lots of carbon rich stuff on top but no nitrogen really mm -hmm. to, to feed it and so same for that thin it and then rotate them let them put thin the it, nitrogen on it rotate it yep and repeat thin it rotate repeat yeah okay this lamb was born that's a this season lamb mm -hmm. and she's already she's already looking pretty good mm-hmm I've had a couple of people who raise sheep in Tennessee and they're like, dude, we never take our rams out. They're, it never gets cold enough here to matter for St. Croix. They're tough as nails. Mm -hmm. They literally, and say, I had a couple that were born in February this year. They did fine. So awesome. I'm not convinced that I'll, I I need to take my rams out, but I might. I might do it anyway. In the wintertime, are you feeding hay then? A little bit, but. They're still finding something. There's there's a ton out here for there's them. There's a ton of stuff out here. And, and I give them, I probably give them one-tenth as much hay as the average rancher would. They, they find stuff to eat. So what do you see, Nick? What do I need to do? differently what do i need to tweak what do i need to <clears throat> improve change man you are you are going spot on with what i'd be doing to be completely honest you're i've been paying attention yeah you have been paying attention you've been doing this intelligently the progress has been measured but not you know balls to the wall you're actually going you know at a measured pace you're not getting crazy. Right. You're not trying to bite off more than you can chew. Right. That, that's why I see either people being too timid and not doing anything, or they're biting off more, they, more than they can chew and burning out. Yeah. And you're not. And I think that's great. I would say you just keep on with what you've been doing. You know, the little tweaks that we've talked about, yeah. when you get your perimeter fence up, that's gonna make this a whole lot easier. Um, one of the few things I would consider, um, I don't know how much poultry y'all like to eat, um, I, so I put everything through spreadsheets Yeah. and, mm -hmm. and so looking at how many, you know, we'll, we'll eat a dozen, maybe two dozen eggs in a day. Same. Yeah. And so I've been looking at what, okay, what, what laying chickens are going to be most productive for me? Mm -hmm. So I put all of the breed info in a spreadsheet and I had a little calculator. I'll eat this many eggs a day. My wife will eat this much. Each of my boys will eat this much and then mm -hmm. a handful of extra yep. per week. And that calculates out this, how many eggs we need in a year, yep. low end and high end on what they normally lay. And son of a gun, um, you know, normally you look at the sex link chickens, the hybrid, right. like the golden comets, the silver queens, not silver queens, uh, cinnamon queens, 
the red sex link, black sex link, all those crosses, they lay very well, right? Yep. I crunched the numbers, and with as many eggs as we eat, and that's a lot, I needed, I think, 44 Delawares versus 40 of the sex link mm. pens. So it's not that big a difference. It's not that big a difference. And then the mm. Delawares mm. are an old-fashioned meat bird. Yeah, exactly. So and why we, the heck would I not raise the old-fashioned right. freaking meat bird? And we have we have golden lace wine dot and silver lace wine dot. Yep. Which are a dual breed, mm -hmm. right? But they lay a ton of eggs. Yeah. And so what my plan is, is when I've got all, everything cleared out, I would, I'm going to build or have built probably a hundred hen mobile chicken coop. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna have that behind the sheep. Okay. So every time I move the sheep, I'll hook up this thing, which is gonna be pullable with the gator. Yep, yep. And just move it to their new pasture. So the reason why I brought that up is as you're transitioning these forest areas, yeah. this forest biome yeah. is fantastic for, uh, for hens. So they're jungle birds. Yeah, yeah. So you have an amazing abundance of fertility and food for those birds right in here and they'll be scratching and they'll be pooping. scratching and fertilizing this while you're doing other things on other areas right. so if you can get some perimeter fencing up yep. and throw birds in there for a week or two right and then move them yep, yep. you can be utilizing a whole bunch of this because yep. if i had in the short term 100 hen um mobile hen yeah and i put it right in the middle of this field they would go absolutely 50 yards out into this yeah yeah they would just cover all this mm -hmm. poop and then any if any of the, the you, sheep you can almost them. get away with no feed inputs when you've got this much for them yeah yeah which good, is amazing good 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 good, good that's good. that's like that's free eggs free eggs i'm all about free eggs i'll take yeah. that so i have saint croix hair sheep mm -hmm. i don't have wool sheep and so wool sheep that's not the natural state of sheep we bred them Mm -hmm. right. To hang on to the wool. To hang on to the wool. That's so not that the we natural could, state of sheep. So that we could harvest it. That's right. Yeah. But now that synthetic fibers, nobody wants wool currently. That'd probably change. Uh, but so these are hair sheep. You don't. You never have to shear them. And because they don't have the wool, you don't have to dock their tails. Mm -hmm. You don't. Ha these are very parasite resistant. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you might have to worm them. But if you're rotating them every three days. When, so when they poop, the eggs of the parasite are in the poop. And if they stay in that same paddock, they're going to get worms. It's going to build up. And so they probably all have a few worms right now, but yeah. it's such a low load, it doesn't affect their production. It doesn't affect their health. They're still fat and muscly. And so rotating them basically breaks the parasite cycle. That's what, I, that's what I'm understanding. Yes, that make, is that that's, right? that's okay. correct. And so I'm, uh, St. Croix, they're a petite breed. And so I'm thinking about maybe trading my St. Croix rams for some Katahdins. Mm -hmm. They're bigger, yep. more meaty, and let my Katahdins rams be Katahdin and all my ewes be St. Croix. So I've got that cross. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm not... Which the Katahdin was bred from St. Croix. That's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's still a little bit of St. Croix. St. <clears throat> Croix is kind of like the, the foundational breed. And they're fantastic in the heat and humidity. Yeah, they don't care at all. They, they like the shade, but as far mm -hmm. as their production, I mean, it's 90, it's 90 degrees plus right now. And they're Do you have fine. to trim their hooves? No. If you feed them grain, you have to trim the hooves. But if they're just eating grass, I'll never trim a hoof. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My gut was saying if you were shooting for around 200 animals, you'd probably be about good. Steers, you mean? Uh, 200 sheep. Oh, sheep, yeah. Yeah. That's now, a, I anticipate. That's a able, lot. Yeah, being able to have about two hundred when I when I'm two done, to four hundred. Yeah. So the sheep were here two or three days ago. Yep. And they were here for three days. And you can see, I, I mm -hmm. just like I told you back there, I went another ten or twenty mm -hmm. feet back into the woods. So they had access not to just the grass and clover, but also to the weeds. Yeah. And they really cleared this out in three days. And this is, well, this may be two acres, mm -hmm. you think? And so they've been on this just two times mm -hmm. since, the, since we've been doing this. It's looking good. And they won't be back here for 20, 25 days at least. That's great. So have you seen any spots where water movement might be a problem or? 
that I need to be thinking about because I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of swales and stuff. I'm I'm not a huge fan of swales either. Okay, okay, it's, okay. It's rare that I'm encouraging people to put in swales. Okay. Um, just was at a place in Tennessee. They were asking about swales. I said, honestly, for what you're going to get out of it and what your purposes are, I would not recommend you put them in. Not worth the effort. No, it's not worth the effort. Sometimes you can have oversaturation downhill. Depends on the, the geology and, you know, what you're dealing with on the ground. I am not, I'm not one of those people that say every single place needs swales. Nope, absolutely not. Because you know, some people do say that. I know, and they're wrong. <laughs> For this kind of environment, you get enough rainfall yeah. that it's not a concern. I don't the, know how much we get a year, but it's a lot. It's a like lot. In, in, yeah, uh, you get more than I do in yeah. Louisiana. Yeah. For what you're doing, what your goals are, I think putting in swales would probably end up just being more of a pain in the ass than it's worth. Um, it's most likely not going to pay itself off. Mm. Maybe that's something that you do in the future just to fine tune things or to address a specific problem mm. or kind of situational. Yeah, like yeah. In this specific maybe, yeah. spot, I need, I need a swell. Exactly. You build a pond and use a swell to help fill it up or something. Right. So that's, that's one of the few times where I say, yes, we absolutely do need a swale, mm. um, is if we're building a pond. Yeah. If we're building a pond, I definitely want to have a swale winging off the side of it, at least one side, so that we can get the water away from the shoulders mm -hmm. of that excavated, <clears throat> compacted earthen wall, right. and we can spill it over somewhere safe. Right. And then also we can put water in there. Mm -hmm. But I always say we should always, always put a swivel pipe in there because we might not want to soak water downhill. Right. Because some environments soaking water downhill underground is more a detriment than a benefit. Really? Yes. Greg has run into this same thing. He put in some swales on one of his places. Greg Judy. Greg Judy, yeah. and it made a nightmare downhill. Well, he's in Missouri. He's got amazing rainfall. Right. Same with here. But We're he got bad advice from somebody who said, you need swales all yep. over. So what else? What else is very popular right now? All the big gurus are talking about it that, that might very often be a waste of time and money. Is there um, anything else like that? So, so we've got the, the swale camp. Yeah. And then we also have the other end of that spectrum. I hate swales. Do key line design. Key line, key right. line, key line, right, key line. Right, right. Um, and I think when you get dogmatic about something like that, you, you start to get blinded to the reality on the ground, which is that those are just tools. Sometimes we need to put down the hammer. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and pick up uh, an impact driver. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need to put that down and pick up a saw. Mm -hmm. Key line design, there's rabid followers. I mean, disciples. Yeah, yeah I've watched many videos. I'm yeah. Like, do I need to do that? <clears throat> Is that a big deal? Again, I mean. Not in Tennessee, probably. It can be, it what, can be helpful. It can be thing? beneficial. Instead of just saying, oh, it's so sexy. It's so cool. I want to be cool like this other person. Um, do you really need to, or would you, would you be wiser to make less of a an investment and get twice as much ROI? One of the the least sexy things that I think has the potential to be one of the most earth shattering and important agricultural innovations is David Johnson and his bioreactor. It's, this is old stuff, okay? We're not, we're not reinventing the wheel, mm -hmm. but a picture is worth a thousand words, and when you see the results that he's getting with his beam system, it is, it's flabbergasting. And it's so dang cheap and simple and easy. I like all those. I love those things. 